The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 1, by Will Durant. Continued. Cassette 12, Side 2. It was the vision of this apparently ridiculous succession of deaths and births that made Buddha scorn human life. Birth, he told himself, is the origin of all evil. And yet birth continues endlessly, forever replenishing the stream of human sorrow. If birth could be stopped, why is birth not stopped? Because the law of karma demands new reincarnations in which the soul may atone for evil done in past existences. If, however, a man could live a life of perfect justice, of unvarying patience and kindness to all, if he could tie his thoughts to eternal things, not binding his heart to those that begin and pass away, then perhaps he would be spared rebirth, and for him the fountain of evil would run dry. If one could still all desires for one's self and seek only to do good, then individuality, that first and worst delusion of mankind, might be overcome and the soul would merge at last with unconscious infinity. What peace there would be in the heart that had cleansed itself of every personal desire, and what heart that had not so cleansed itself could ever know peace? Happiness is possible neither here, as paganism thinks, nor hereafter, as many religions think. Only peace is possible, only the cool quietude of craving ended, only nirvana. And so, after seven years of meditation, the enlightened one, having learned the cause of human suffering, went forth to the holy city of Benares, and there, in the deer park at Sarnath, preached nirvana to men. 4. The Teaching of Buddha Portrait of the Master, His Methods, The Four Noble Truths, The Eightfold Way, The Five Moral Rules, Buddha and Christ, Buddha's Agnosticism and Anti-Clericalism, His Atheism, His Soulless Psychology, The Meaning of Nirvana. Like other teachers of his time, Buddha taught through conversation lectures and parables. Since it never occurred to him any more than to Socrates or Christ to put his doctrine into writing, he summarized it in sutras, threads, designed to prompt the memory. As preserved for us in the remembrance of his followers, these discourses unconsciously portray for us the first distinct character in India's history. A man of strong will, authoritative and proud, but of gentle manner and speech, and of infinite benevolence. He claimed enlightenment, but not inspiration. He never pretended that a god was speaking through him. In controversy, he was more patient and considerate than any other of the great teachers of mankind. His disciples, perhaps idealizing him, represented him as fully practicing ahimsa. Putting away the killing of living things, Gautama the recluse holds aloof from the destruction of life. He, once a Kshatriya warrior, has laid the cudgel and the sword aside, and ashamed of roughness and full of mercy, he dwells compassionate and kind to all creatures that have life. Putting away slander, Gautama holds himself aloof from calumny. Thus does he live as a binder together of those who are divided, an encourager of those who are friends, a peacemaker, a lover of peace, impassioned for peace, a speaker of words that make for peace. Like Lao Tse and Christ, he wished to return good for evil, love for hate, and he remained silent under misunderstanding and abuse. If a man foolishly does me wrong, I will return to him the protection of my ungrudging love. The more evil comes from him, the more good shall come from me. When a simpleton abused him, Buddha listened in silence. But when the man had finished, Buddha asked him, Son, if a man declined to accept a present made to him, to whom would it belong? The man answered, To him who offered it. My son, said Buddha, I decline to accept your abuse and request you to keep it for yourself. Unlike most saints, Buddha had a sense of humor and knew that metaphysics without laughter is immodesty. His method of teaching was unique, though it owed something to the wanderers or traveling sophists of his time. He walked from town to town, accompanied by his favorite disciples, and followed by as many as twelve hundred devotees. He took no thought for the morrow, but was content to be fed by some local admirer, once he scandalized his followers by eating in the home of a courtesan. He stopped at the outskirts of a village and pitched camp in some garden or wood or on some river bank. The afternoon he gave to meditation, the evening to instruction. His discourses took the form of Socratic questioning, moral parables, courteous controversy, or succinct formulas whereby he sought to compress his teaching into convenient brevity and order. His favorite sutra was The Four Noble Truths, 
in which he expounded his view that life is pain, that pain is due to desire, and that wisdom lies in stilling all desire. 1. Now this, O monks, is the noble truth of pain. Birth is painful, sickness is painful, old age is painful. Sorrow, lamentation, dejection, and despair are painful. 2. Now this, O monks, is the noble truth of the cause of pain. That craving which leads to rebirth, combined with pleasure and lust, finding pleasure here and there, namely the craving for passion, the craving for existence, the craving for non-existence. 3. Now this, O monks, is the noble truth of the cessation of pain, the cessation without a remainder of that craving, abandonment, forsaking, release, non-attachment. 4. Now this, O monks, is the noble truth of the way that leads to the cessation of pain. This is the noble eightfold way, namely, right views, right intention, right speech, right action, right living, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. Buddha was convinced that pain so overbalanced pleasure in human life that it would be better never to have been born. More tears have flowed, he tells us, than all the water that is in the four great oceans. Every pleasure seemed poisoned for him by its brevity. Is that which is impermanent, sorrow or joy? He asks one of his disciples, and the answer is, Sorrow, Lord. The basic evil, then, is tana, not all desire, but selfish desire, desire directed to the advantage of the part rather than to the good of the whole. Above all, sexual desire, for that leads to reproduction, which stretches out the chain of life into new suffering aimlessly. One of his disciples concluded that Buddha would approve of suicide, but Buddha reproved him. Suicide would be useless, since the soul, unpurified, would be reborn in other incarnations until it achieved complete forgetfulness of self. When his disciples asked him to define more clearly his conception of right living, he formulated for their guidance five moral rules, commandments, simple and brief, but perhaps more comprehensive and harder to keep than the Decalogue. 1. Let not one kill any living being. 2. Let not one take what is not given to him. 3. Let not one speak falsely. 4. Let not one drink intoxicating drinks. 5. Let not one be unchaste. Elsewhere, Buddha introduced elements into his teaching strangely anticipatory of Christ. Let a man overcome anger by kindness, evil by good. Victory breeds hatred, for the conquered is unhappy. Never in the world does hatred cease by hatred. Hatred ceases by love. Like Jesus, he was uncomfortable in the presence of women and hesitated long before admitting them into the Buddhist order. His favorite disciple, Ananda, once asked him, How are we to conduct ourselves, Lord, with regards to womankind? As not seeing them, Ananda. But if we should see them, what are we to do? No talking, Ananda. But if they should speak to us, Lord, what are we to do? Keep wide awake, Ananda. His conception of religion was purely ethical. He cared everything about conduct, nothing about ritual or worship, metaphysics or theology. When a Brahmin proposed to purify himself of his sins by bathing at Gaya, Buddha said to him, Have thy bath here, even here, O Brahmin. Be kind to all beings. If thou speakest not false, if thou killest not life, if thou takest not what is not given to thee, secure in self-denial, what wouldst thou gain by going to Gaya? Any water is Gaya to thee. There is nothing stranger in the history of religion than the sight of Buddha founding a worldwide religion and yet refusing to be drawn into any discussion about eternity, immortality, or God. The infinite is a myth, he says, a fiction of philosophers who have not the modesty to confess that an atom can never understand the cosmos. He smiles at the debate over the finity or infinity of the universe, quite as if he foresaw the futile astro-mythology of physicists and mathematicians who debate the same question today. He refuses to express any opinion as to whether the world had a beginning or will have an end, whether the soul is the same as the body or distinct from it, whether even for the greatest saint there is to be any reward in any heaven. He calls such questions the jungle, the desert, the puppet show, the writhing, the entanglement of speculation, and will have nothing to do with them. They lead only to feverish disputation, personal resentments and sorrow. They never lead to wisdom and peace. Saintliness and content lie not in knowledge of the universe and God, but simply in selfless and beneficent living. And then, with scandalous humor, he suggests that the gods themselves, if they existed, could not answer these questions. Once upon a time, Kevada, 
there occurred to a certain brother in this very company of the brethren a doubt on the following point. Where now do these four great elements, earth, water, fire, and wind, pass away, leaving no trace behind? So that brother worked himself into such a state of ecstasy that the way leading to the world of the gods became clear to his ecstatic vision. Then that brother, Kevada, went up to the realm of the four great kings and said to the gods thereof, Where, my friends, do the four great elements, earth, water, fire, and wind, cease, leaving no trace behind? And when he had thus spoken, the gods in the heaven of the four great kings said to him, We, brother, do not know that. But there are the four great kings, more potent and more glorious than we. They will know it. Then that brother Kavada went to the four great kings, and put the same question, and was sent on by a similar reply to the thirty-three, who sent him on to their king Saka, who sent him on to the Yama gods, who sent him on to their king Suyama, who sent him on to the Tusita gods, who sent him on to their king Santusita, who sent him on to the Nimanarati gods, who sent him on to their king Sunimata, who sent him on to the Paranimata Vasavati gods, who sent him on to their king Vasavati, who sent him on to the gods of the Brahma world. Then that brother, Kevada, became so absorbed by self-concentration that the way to the Brahma world became clear to his mind, thus pacified. And he drew near to the gods of the retinue of Brahma and said, Where, my friends, to the four great elements, earth, water, fire, and wind, cease, leaving no trace behind? And when he had thus spoken, the gods of the retinue of Brahma replied, We, brother, do not know that. But there is Brahma, the great Brahma, the supreme one, the mighty one, the all-seeing one, the ruler, the lord of all, the controller, the creator, the chief of all, the ancient of days, the father of all that are and are to be. He is more potent and more glorious than we. He will know it. Where then is that great Brahma now? We, brother, know not where Brahma is, nor why Brahma is, nor whence. But, brother, when the signs of his coming appear, when the light ariseth and the glory shineth, then will he be manifest, for that is the portent of the manifestation of Brahma when the light ariseth and the glory shineth. And it was not long, Kivada, before that great Brahma became manifest. And that brother drew near to him and said, Where, my friend, do the four great elements, earth, water, fire, and wind, cease, leaving no trace behind? And when he had thus spoken, that great Brahma said to him, I, brother, and the great Brahma, the supreme, the mighty, the all-seeing, the ruler, the lord of all, the controller, the creator, the chief of all, appointing each to his place, the ancient of days, the father of all that are and are to be. Then that brother answered Brahma and said, I did not ask you, friend, as to whether you were indeed all that you now say, but I ask you where the four great elements, earth, water, fire, and wind, cease, leaving no trace behind. Then again, Kevara, Brahma gave the same reply. And that brother yet a third time put to Brahma his question as before. Then, Kevada, the great Brahma took that brother and led him aside and said, These gods, the retinue of Brahma, hold me, brother, to be such that there is nothing I cannot see, nothing I have not understood, nothing I have not realized. Therefore I gave no answer in their presence. I do not know, brother, where those four great elements, earth, water, fire, and wind, cease, leaving no trace behind. When some students remind him that the Brahmins claim to know the solutions of these problems, he laughs them off. There are, brethren, some recluses and Brahmins who wriggle like eels, and when a question is put to them on this or that, they resort to equivocation, to eel wriggling. If ever he is sharp, it is against the priests of his time. He scorns their assumption that the Vedas were inspired by the gods, and he scandalizes the caste-proud Brahmins by accepting into his order the members of any caste. He does not explicitly condemn the caste system, but he tells his disciples plainly enough, Go into all lands and preach this gospel. Tell them that the poor and the lowly, the rich and the high are all one, and that all castes unite in this religion as do the rivers in the sea. He denounces the notion of sacrificing to the gods, and looks with horror upon the slaughter of animals for these rites. He rejects all cult and worship of supernatural beings, all mantras and incantations, all asceticism and all prayer. Quietly and without controversy, he offers a religion absolutely free of dogma and priestcraft, and proclaims a way of salvation open to infidels and believers alike. At times this most famous of Hindu saints passes from agnosticism to outright atheism. He does not go out of his way to deny deity, and occasionally he speaks as if Brahma were a reality rather than an ideal nor does he forbid the popular worship of the gods. 
but he smiles at the notion of sending up prayers to the unknowable. It is foolish, he says, to suppose that another can cause us happiness or misery. These are always the product of our own behavior and our own desires. He refuses to rest his moral code upon supernatural sanctions of any kind. He offers no heaven, no purgatory, and no hell. He is too sensitive to the suffering and killing involved in the biological process to suppose that they have been consciously willed by a personal divinity. These cosmic blunders, he thinks, outweigh the evidences of design. In this scene of order and confusion, of good and evil, he finds no principle of permanence, no center of everlasting reality, but only a whirl and flux of obstinate life, in which the one metaphysical ultimate is change. As he proposes a theology without a deity, so he offers a psychology without a soul. He repudiates animism in every form, even in the case of man. He agrees with Heraclitus and Bergson about the world, and with Hume about the mind. All that we know is our sensations. Therefore, so far as we can see, all matter is force, all substance is motion. Life is change, a neutral stream of becoming and extinction. The soul is a myth which, for the convenience of our weak brains, we unwarrantably posit behind the flow of conscious states. This transcendental unity of apperception, this mind that weaves sensations and perceptions into thought, is a ghost. All that exists is the sensations and perceptions themselves, falling automatically into memories and ideas. Even the precious ego is not an entity distinct from these mental states. It is merely the continuity of these states, the remembrance of earlier by later states, together with the mental and moral habits, the dispositions and tendencies of the organism. The succession of these states is caused not by a mythical will superadded to them, but by the determinism of heredity, habit, environment, and circumstance. This fluid mind that is only mental states, this soul or ego that is only a character or prejudice formed by helpless inheritance and transient experience, can have no immortality in any sense that implies the continuance of the individual. Even the saint, even Buddha himself, will not, as a personality, survive death. But if this is so, how can there be rebirth? If there is no soul, how can it pass into other existences to be punished for the sins of this embodiment? Here is the weakest point in Buddha's philosophy. He never quite faces the contradiction between his rationalistic psychology and his uncritical acceptance of reincarnation. This belief is so universal in India that almost every Hindu accepts it as an axiom or assumption and hardly bothers to prove it. The brevity and multiplicity of the generations there suggests irresistibly the transmigration of vital force, or to speak theologically, of the soul. Buddha received the notion along with the air he breathed. It is the one thing that he seems never to have doubted. He took the wheel of rebirth and the law of karma for granted. His one thought was how to escape from that wheel, how to achieve nirvana here and annihilation hereafter. But what is nirvana? It is difficult to find an erroneous answer to this question, for the Master left the point obscure, and his followers have given the word every meaning under the sun. In general Sanskrit use, it meant extinguished, as of a lamp or fire. The Buddhist scriptures use it as signifying, one, a state of happiness attainable in this life through the complete elimination of selfish desires, two, the liberation of the individual from rebirth, three, the annihilation of the individual consciousness, four, the union of the individual with God, five, a heaven of happiness after death. In the teaching of Buddha it seemed to mean the extinction of all individual desire and the reward of such selflessness, escape from rebirth. In Buddhist literature the term has often a terrestrial sense, for the arhat or saint is repeatedly described as achieving it in this life by acquiring its seven constituent parts, self-possession, investigation into the truth, energy, calm, joy, concentration, and magnanimity. These are its content, but hardly its productive cause. The cause and source of nirvana is the extinction of selfish desire, and nirvana, in most early contexts, comes to mean the painless peace that rewards the moral annihilation of the self. Now, says Buddha, this is the noble truth as to the passing of pain. Verily, it is the passing away so that no passion remains, the giving up, the getting rid of, the emancipation from, the harboring no longer of, this craving thirst, this fever of self-seeking desire. In the body of the Master's teaching it is almost always synonymous with bliss, 
the quiet content of the soul that no longer worries about itself. But complete nirvana includes annihilation. The reward of the highest saintliness is never to be reborn. In the end, says Buddha, we perceive the absurdity of moral and psychological individualism. Our fretting selves are not really separate beings and powers, but passing ripples on the stream of life, little knots forming and unraveling in the wind-blown mesh of fate. When we see ourselves as parts of a whole, when we reform ourselves and our desires in terms of the whole, then our personal disappointments and defeats, our varied suffering and inevitable death, no longer sadden us as bitterly as before. They are lost in the amplitude of infinity. When we have learned to love not our separate life, but all men and all living things, then at last we shall find peace. 5. The Last Days of Buddha His Miracles He Visits His Father's House The Buddhist Monks Death From this exalted philosophy we pass to the simple legends which are all that we have concerning Buddha's later life and death. Despite his scorn of miracles, his disciples brewed a thousand tales of the marvels that he wrought. He wafted himself magically across the Ganges in a moment. The toothpick he had let fall sprouted into a tree. At the end of one of his sermons the thousandfold world system shook. When his enemy, Devadatta, sent a fierce elephant against him, Buddha pervaded it with love, and it was quite subdued. Arguing from such pleasantries, Senart and others have concluded that the legend of Buddha has been formed on the basis of ancient sun myths. It is unimportant. Buddha means for us the ideas attributed to Buddha in the Buddhist literature, and this Buddha exists. The Buddhist scriptures paint a pleasing picture of him. Many disciples gathered around him, and his fame as a sage spread through the cities of northern India. When his father heard that Buddha was near Kapilavastu, he sent a messenger to him with an invitation to come and spend a day in his boyhood home. He went, and his father, who had mourned the loss of a prince, rejoiced for a while over the return of a saint. Buddha's wife, who had been faithful to him during all their separation, fell down before him, clasped his ankles, placed his feet above her head, and reverenced him as a god. Then King Shuddhodana told Buddha of her great love. Lord, my daughter-in-law, when she heard that you were wearing yellow robes as a monk, put on yellow robes. When she heard of your having one meal a day, herself took one meal. When she knew that you had given up a large bed, she lay on a narrow couch. And when she knew that you had given up garlands and scents, she gave them up. Buddha blessed her and went his way. But now his son Rahula came to him and also loved him. Pleasant is your shadow ascetic, he said. Though Rahula's mother had hoped to see the youth made king, the master accepted him into the Buddhist order. Then another prince, Nanda, was called to be consecrated as heir apparent to the throne. But Nanda, as if in a trance, left the ceremony unfinished, abandoned the kingdom, and going to Buddha, asked that he too might be permitted to join the order. When King Shuddhodana heard of this, he was sad and asked a boon of Buddha. When the Lord abandoned the world, he said, it was no small pain to me. So when Nanda went, and even more so with Rahula, the love of a son cuts through the skin, through the hide, the flesh, the sinew, the marrow. Grant, Lord, that thy noble ones may not confer the ordination on a son without the permission of his father and mother. Buddha consented and made such permission a prerequisite to ordination. Already, it seems, this religion without priestcraft had developed an order of monks dangerously like the Hindu priests. Buddha would not be long dead before they would surround themselves with all the paraphernalia of the Brahmins. Indeed, it was from the ranks of the Brahmins that the first converts came, and then from the richest youth of Benares and the neighboring towns. These bhikkhus, or monks, practiced in Buddha's days a simple rule. They saluted one another and all those to whom they spoke with an admirable phrase, Peace to all beings. They were not to kill any living thing. They were never to take anything save what was given them. They were to avoid falsehood and slander. They were to heal divisions and encourage concord. They were always to show compassion for all men and all animals. They were to shun all amusements of sense or flesh, all music, nouch dances, shows, games, luxuries, idle conversation, argument, or fortune-telling. They were to have nothing to do with business or with any form of buying or selling. Above all, they were to abandon incontinence and live apart from women in perfect chastity. Yielding to many soft entreaties, Buddha allowed women to enter the order as nuns, but he never completely reconciled himself to this move. If, Ananda, he said, women had not received permission to enter the order, the pure religion would have lasted long, the good law would, would have stood fast a thousand years. But since they have received that permission, it will now stand fast for only five hundred years. He was right. The great order, or Sangha, has survived to our own time, but
but it has long since corrupted the master's doctrine with magic, polytheism, and countless superstitions. Towards the end of his long life, his followers already began to deify him, despite his challenge to them to doubt him and to think for themselves. Now, says one of the last dialogues, the venerable Sariputta came to the place where the exalted one was, and having saluted him, took his seat respectfully at his side, and said, Lord, such faith have I in the exalted one, that methinks there never has been, nor will there be, nor is there now any other, whether wanderer or Brahman, who is greater and wiser than the exalted one, as regards the higher wisdom. Great and bold are the words of thy mouth, Sariputta, answered the master. Verily, thou hast burst forth into a song of ecstasy. Of course, then, thou hast known all the exalted ones of the past, comprehending their minds with yours, and aware what their conduct was, what their wisdom, and what the emancipation they attained to. Not so, O Lord. Of course, then, thou hast perceived all the exalted ones of the future, comprehending their whole minds with yours. Not so, O Lord. But at least, then, O Sariputta, thou knowest me, and hast penetrated my mind. Not even that, O Lord. You see, then, Sariputta, that you know not the hearts of the able awakened ones of the past and of the future. Why, therefore, are your words so grand and bold? Why do you burst forth into such a song of ecstasy? And to Ananda he taught his greatest and noblest lesson. And whosoever, Ananda, either now or after I am dead, shall be a lamp unto themselves and a refuge unto themselves, shall betake themselves to no external refuge, but holding fast to the truth as their lamp, shall not look for refuge to any one besides themselves. It is they who shall reach the very topmost height, but they must be anxious to learn. He died in 483 B.C. at the age of eighty. Now then, O monks, he said to them as his last words, I address you, subject to decay are compound things. Strive with earnestness. Chapter 16 From Alexander to Aurangzeb 1. Chandragupta Alexander in India, Chandragupta the Liberator, the people, the University of Taxila, the royal palace, a day in the life of a king, an older Machiavelli, administration, law, public health, transport and roads, municipal government. In the year 327 B.C., Alexander the Great, pushing on from Persia, marched over the Hindu Kush and descended upon India. For a year he campaigned among the northwestern states that had formed one of the Persian Empire's richest provinces, exacting supplies for his troops and gold for his treasury. Early in 326 B.C. he crossed the Indus, fought his way slowly through Taxila and Rawalpindi to the south and east, encountered the army of King Porus, defeated 30,000 infantry, 4,000 cavalry, 300 chariots and 200 elephants, and slew 12,000 men. When Porus, having fought to the last, surrendered, Alexander, admiring his courage, stature, and fine features, bade him say what treatment he wished to receive. "'Treat me, Alexander,' he answered, "'in a kingly way. "'For my own sake,' said Alexander, "'thou shalt be so treated. "'For thine own sake do thou demand what is pleasing to thee.' But Porus said that everything was included in what he had asked. Alexander was much pleased with this reply. He made Porus king of all conquered India as a Macedonian tributary, and found him thereafter a faithful and energetic ally. Alexander wished then to advance even to the eastern sea, but his soldiers protested. After much oratory and pouting, he yielded to them, and led them, through patriotically hostile tribes that made his wearied troops fight almost every foot of the way, down the Hydaspes and up the coast through Gedrosia to Baluchistan. When he arrived at Susa, twenty months after turning back from his conquests, his army was but a miserable fragment of that which had crossed into India with him three years before. Seven years later, all trace of Macedonian authority had already disappeared from India. The chief agent of its removal was one of the most romantic figures in Indian history, a lesser warrior but a greater ruler than Alexander. Chandragupta was a young Kshatriya noble exiled from Magadha by the ruling Nanda family, to which he was related. Helped by his subtle Machiavellian adviser, Kautilya Chanakya, the youth organized a small army, overcame the Macedonian garrisons, and declared India free. Then he advanced upon Pataliputra, capital of the Magadha kingdom, fomented a revolution, seized the throne, and established that Mauryan dynasty which was to rule Hindustan and Afghanistan for 137 years. 
Subordinating his courage to Kautilya's unscrupulous wisdom, Chandragupta soon made his government the most powerful then existing in the world. When Megasthenes came to Pataliputra as ambassador from Seleucus Nicator, king of Syria, he was amazed to find a civilization which he described to the incredulous Greeks, still near their zenith, as entirely equal to their own. The Greek gave a pleasant, perhaps a lenient, account of Hindu life in his time. It struck him as a favorable contrast with his own nation that there was no slavery in India, that though the population was divided into castes according to occupations, it accepted these divisions as natural and tolerable. They live happily enough, the ambassador reported, being simple in their manners and frugal. They never drink wine except at sacrifice. The simplicity of their laws and their contracts is proved by the fact that they seldom go to law. They have no suits about pledges and deposits, nor do they require either seals or witnesses, but make their deposits and confide in each other. Truth and virtue they hold alike in esteem. The greater part of the soil is under irrigation, and consequently bears two crops in the course of the year. It is accordingly affirmed that famine has never visited India, and that there has never been a general scarcity in the supply of nourishing food. The oldest of the two thousand cities of northern India in Chandragupta's time was Taxila, twenty miles northwest of the modern Rawalpindi. Aryan describes it as a large and prosperous city. Strabo says it is large and has most excellent laws. It was both a military and a university town, strategically situated on the main road to Western Asia and containing the most famous of the several universities possessed by India at that time. Students flocked to Taxila as in the Middle Ages they flocked to Paris. There all the arts and sciences could be studied under eminent professors, and the medical school especially was held in high repute throughout the Oriental world. Megasthenes describes Chandragupta's capital, Pataliputra, as nine miles in length and almost two miles in width. The palace of the king was of timber, but the Greek ambassador ranked it as excelling the royal residences of Susa and Ecbatana, being surpassed only by those at Persepolis. Its pillars were plated with gold and ornamented with designs of bird life and foliage. Its interior was sumptuously furnished and adorned with precious metals and stones. There was a certain oriental ostentation in this culture, as in the use of gold vessels six feet in diameter. But an English historian concludes, from the testimony of the literary, pictorial, and material remains, that in the fourth and third centuries before Christ, the command of the Maria monarch over luxuries of all kinds and skilled craftsmanship and all the manual arts was not inferior to that enjoyed by the Mughal emperors eighteen centuries later. In this palace, Chandragupta, having won the throne by violence, lived for twenty-four years as in a gilded jail. Occasionally he appeared in public clad in fine muslin embroidered with purple and gold, and carried in a gold palanquin or on a gorgeously accoutred elephant. Except when he rode out to the hunt or otherwise amused himself, he found his time crowded with the business of his growing realm. His days were divided into sixteen periods of ninety minutes each. In the first he arose and prepared himself by meditation. In the second he studied the reports of his agents and issued secret instructions. The third he spent with his counselors in the hall of private audience. In the fourth he attended to state finances and national defense. In the fifth he heard the petitions and suits of his subjects. In the sixth he bathed and dined and read religious literature. In the seventh he received taxes and tribute and made official appointments. In the eighth he again met his council and heard the reports of his spies, including the courtesans whom he used for this purpose. The ninth he devoted to relaxation and prayer, the tenth and eleventh to military matters, the twelfth again to secret reports, the thirteenth to the evening bath and repast, the fourteenth, fifteenth, and sixteenth, to sleep. Perhaps the historian tells us what Chandragupta might have been or how Kautilya wished the people to picture him, rather than what he really was. Truth does not often escape from palaces. The actual direction of government was in the hands of the crafty vizier. Kautilya was a Brahmin who knew the political value of religion, but took no moral guidance from it. Like our modern dictators, he believed that every means was justifiable if used in the service of the state. He was unscrupulous and treacherous, but never to his king. He served Chandragupta through exile, defeat, adventure, intrigue, murder, and victory, and by his wily wisdom made the empire of his master the greatest that India had ever known. Like the author of The Prince, Kautilya saw fit to preserve in writing his formulas for warfare and diplomacy. Tradition ascribes to him the Arthashastra, the oldest book in extant Sanskrit literature. As an example of its delicate realism, we may take its list of means for capturing a fort. Intrigue, spies, winning over the enemy's people, siege, and assault. 
a wise economy of physical effort. The government made no pretense to democracy and was probably the most efficient that India has ever had. Akbar, greatest of the Mughals, had nothing like it, and it may be doubted if any of the ancient Greek cities were better organized. It was based, frankly, upon military power. Chandragupta, if we may trust Megasthenes, who would be as suspect as any foreign correspondent, kept an army of 600,000 foot, 30,000 horse, 9,000 elephants, and an unnamed number of chariots. The peasantry and the Brahmins were exempt from military service, and Strabo describes the farmers tilling the soil in peace and security in the midst of war. The power of the king was theoretically unlimited, but in practice it was restricted by a council which, sometimes with the king, sometimes in his absence, initiated legislation, regulated national finances and foreign affairs, and appointed all the more important officers of state. Megasthenes testifies to the high character and wisdom of Chandragupta's counselors and to their effective power. The government was organized into departments with well-defined duties and a carefully graded hierarchy of officials, managing respectively revenue, customs, frontiers, passports, communications, excise, mines, agriculture, cattle, commerce, warehouses, navigation, forests, public games, prostitution, and the mint. The superintendent of excise controlled the sale of drugs and intoxicating drinks, restricted the number and location of taverns, and the quantity of liquors which they might sell. The superintendent of mines leased mining areas to private persons, who paid a fixed rent and a share of the profits to the government. A similar system applied to agriculture, for all the land was owned by the state. The superintendent of public games supervised the gambling halls, supplied dice, charged a fee for their use, and gathered in for the treasury five percent of all money taken in by the bank. The superintendent of prostitution looked after public women, controlled their charges and expenditures, appropriated their earnings for two days of each month, and kept two of them in the royal palace for entertainment and intelligence service. Taxes fell upon every profession, occupation, and industry. And in addition, rich men were from time to time persuaded to make benevolences to the king. The government regulated prices and periodically assayed weights and measures. It carried on some manufactures in state factories, sold vegetables, and kept a monopoly of mines, salt, timber, fine fabrics, horses, and elephants. Law was administered in the village by local headmen or by panchayats, village councils of five men. In towns, districts, and provinces, by inferior and superior courts, at the capital by the royal council as a supreme court, and by the king as a court of last appeal. Penalties were severe and included mutilation, torture, and death, usually on the principle of lex talionis or equivalent retaliation. But the government was no mere engine of repression. It attended to sanitation and public health, maintained hospitals and poor relief stations, distributed in famine years the food kept in state warehouses for such emergencies, forced the rich to contribute to the assistance of the destitute, and organized great public works to care for the unemployed in depression years. The Department of Navigation regulated water transport and protected travelers on rivers and seas. It maintained bridges and harbors and provided government ferries in addition to those that were privately managed and owned, an admirable arrangement whereby public competition could check private plunder and private competition could discourage official extravagance. The Department of Communications built and repaired roads throughout the empire from the narrow wagon tracks of the villages to trade routes 32 feet and royal roads 64 feet wide. One of these imperial highways extended 1,200 miles from Pataliputra to the northwestern frontier, a distance equal to half the transcontinental spread of the United States. At approximately every mile, says Megasthenes, these roads were marked with pillars indicating directions and distances to various destinations. Shade trees, wells, police stations, and hotels were provided at regular intervals along the route. Transport was by chariots, palanquins, bullock carts, horses, camels, elephants, asses, and men. Elephants were a luxury usually confined to royalty and officialdom, and so highly valued that a woman's virtue was thought a moderate price to pay for one of them. The same method of departmental administration was applied to the government of the cities. Pataliputra was ruled by a commission of thirty men divided into six groups. One group regulated industry, another supervised strangers, assigning to them lodgings and attendants and watching their movements. Another kept a record of births and deaths. Another licensed merchants, regulated the sale of produce, and tested measures and weights. Another controlled the sale of manufactured articles. Another collected a tax of ten percent on all sales. In short, says Havel, 
Pataliputra in the 4th century BC seems to have been a thoroughly well-organized city and administered according to the best principles of social science. The perfection of the arrangements thus indicated, says Vincent Smith, is astonishing, even when exhibited in outline. Examination of the departmental details increases our wonder that such an organization could have been planned and efficiently operated in India in 300 BC. The one defect of this government was autocracy and therefore continual dependence upon force and spies. Like every autocrat, Chandragupta held his power precariously, always fearing revolt and assassination. Every night he used a different bedroom, and always he was surrounded by guards. Hindu tradition, accepted by European historians, tells how, when a long famine, Pache Megasthenes, came upon his kingdom, Chandragupta, in despair at his helplessness, abdicated his throne, lived for twelve years thereafter as a giant ascetic, and then starved himself to death. All things considered, said Voltaire, the life of a gondolier is preferable to that of a doja, but I believe the difference is so trifling that it is not worth the trouble of examining. 2. The Philosopher King, Ashoka, the Edict of Tolerance, Ashoka's Missionaries, His Failure, His Success. Chandragupta's successor, Bindusara, was apparently a man of some intellectual inclination. He is said to have asked Antiochus, king of Syria, to make him a present of a Greek philosopher. For a real Greek philosopher, wrote Bindusara, he would pay a high price. The proposal could not be complied with since Antiochus found no philosophers for sale, but chance atoned by giving Bindusara, a philosopher for his son. Ashoka Vardhana mounted the throne in 273 B.C., he found himself ruler of a vaster empire than any Indian monarch before him. Afghanistan, Baluchistan, and all of modern India but the extreme south, Tamilakam, or Tamil land. For a time he governed in the spirit of his grandfather Chandragupta, cruelly but well. Yuan Chuang, a Chinese traveler who spent many years in India in the 7th century AD, tells us that the prison maintained by Ashoka north of the capital was still remembered in Hindu tradition as Ashoka's hell. There, said his informants, all the tortures of any orthodox inferno had been used in the punishment of criminals, to which the king added an edict that no one who entered that dungeon should ever come out of it alive. But one day, a Buddhist saint, imprisoned there without cause, and flung into a cauldron of hot water, refused to boil. The jailer sent word to Ashoka, who came, saw, and marveled. When the king turned to leave, the jailer reminded him that according to his own edict he must not leave the prison alive. The king admitted the force of the remark, and ordered the jailer to be thrown into the cauldron. On returning to his palace, Ashoka, we are told, underwent a profound conversion. This book is continued on Cassette 13, Side 1.